our, uh, our program is uh, and divided up into segments uh, related to the areas that we thought, uh, <coughs> that is to say, the boards of, of the Professional Accounting Center uh, thought were useful in uh, exploring uh, in terms of our mandate. Uh, we thought that uh, we would be interested in looking at the challenges facing the profession because we thought there were new roles that professional accountants could play. And uh, we wanted to inform uh, those of you who have come and uh, via the videotape uh, on the latest uh, information on these particular uh, areas of interest and potential roles. So our program uh, begins with the area of, of governance and moves on to innovation, uh, innovative financial and non-financial reporting. And uh, as part of that, we have uh, a gentleman coming who is a, a critic of uh, uh, professional accounting uh, because he, he is a principal in Veritas Investment Research which uh, looks for anomalies to help their investors and perhaps improve, improve uh, disclosure. So this is his opportunity to speak to the group and uh, we look forward to hearing what he has to say. But the first part of the agenda deals with uh, governance. Now, governance is a subject we don't teach to, uh, to marketing people or OB people, uh, generally speaking, uh, and even lawyers get a, a very uh, narrow slice of it. But uh, professional accountants rely upon governance, uh, proper governance, good culture and organizations for the accuracy of their reporting and the way the companies behave. And we thought that perhaps professional accountants should be looking for an increased role uh, in the governance area. So we have, we have two sessions here uh, this morning uh, on, on governance and uh, the first uh, of those deals with um, long form uh, reporting uh, which has uh, <coughs> come into force in the, United, in the UK uh, and also uh, we thought it would be appropriate for you to understand the developments in terms of disclosures in, in, uh, uh, in Europe, and it turns out that we have excellent speakers in both those areas as well as a, uh, a, uh, a, a colleague uh, uh, who has uh, been doing research in the area, and uh, we, so we have three speakers I think you're going to enjoy uh, significantly. And to introduce those speakers, I would call upon uh, Dushant uh, Vias. Dushant, do you want to come up? Hey, good morning. Uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the first panel. So first up, we have uh, Mark Babington, who's here to uh, provide us with the UK experience uh, perspective on his experience in the uh, in the UK implementing the uh, long form uh, audit report. He's uh, Mark is the uh, deputy director for audit policy at the UK uh, Financial Reporting Council. Um, which is uh, the audit and accounting watchdog in the UK. Uh, Mark brings with him uh, more than 20 years of experience in the, in the government and the non-for-profit non sector. And he has a very interesting background. Uh, he's done some very cool things such as auditing uh, UN peacekeeping camps on the India-Pakistan border as well. Uh, prior to joining the FRC, Mark was uh, the director of, uh, at the National Audit Office in the, in the UK. Um, and he has served on a variety of uh, very important uh, UK and EU uh, regulatory bodies. Okay. So we look forward to, forward to hearing his perspectives. Next up, we have uh, Johanna Pastor. Did I say that right? Uh, he brings together uh, a very unique international auditing experience to us. Uh, he's a partner at KPMG. Uh, currently, he's heading the, uh, the Global uh, Financial Services Audit Practice, and he's also the uh, insurance sector leader at KPMG. Um, as I said, he has a very extensive international experience. He's worked in, the, uh, in Germany, Spain, the US, and of course in, uh, in Canada as well. All right, and he's advised uh, some very large uh, global financial institutions. And, and last but not the least, uh, a good friend of mine uh, and our former colleague, in fact, our very own Miguel Minuti, uh, he, uh, he was, he's a former MMPA student. He's also a former Rotman PhD student. He's now, now an associate professor at uh, University of Miami. Uh, he's been uh, immensely successful in research. Uh, in fact, 
Um, at this uh, young age, he's an editor of CAR. He's on the editorial board of uh, Journal of Accounting Research. Uh, he organizes the PCOB, one of the organizing members uh, of the PCOB uh, annual conference. Um, and I was going to say he's written the only research paper on, uh, on, on the UK uh, long form audit report, but he's just told me that there are there are two other competing papers out there now. So, but he's here to share his uh, research experience with us. Okay, so Mark. It's it's first of all very very nice for me to be uh, back in Toronto. Um, I think having heard of some of the things I've done before, I quite welcome the fact of coming somewhere safe for a change. Um, <laughs> I want to spend about 20 minutes um, going through our experience in the UK of, of what's happened with, uh, with long-form audit reporting. And I say that from the perspective of having spent 20 years as an auditor and thinking about how we communicate um, with those that we audit and those who use the products of our audit, um, but also to think more widely about sort of innovation in audit reporting, what it means and, and what the next steps might be. And, um, and, and perhaps the thing that I want to sort of say from the outset is, is that what has been achieved in the UK has been achieved not by imposing broad regulatory requirements. Rather, what we did was set a series of high-level principles and left the rest, in a sense, to the audit market. So a challenge to the audit firms to see in what way they want to innovate and also a challenge to investors and those who use auditors' reports to say, well, what do you actually want? So the background to, to what I'm going to say is, is very much sort of um, linked in with the reform of um, corporate governance in 2012 and, and the FRC's work to build trust in financial reporting. And in a sense, that um, draws um, a lot of experience from the financial crisis of 2008, 2009 onwards. Um, to think about what we can do to make audit more transparent, to deliver better quality work, and, and, and again, to, to build public trust, because um, trust in, in audit is absolutely fundamental to what we do, and we have to be able to demonstrate that we've got a product that adds genuine value for the users of financial statements and gives investors confidence that they can take decisions on the back of audited financial information. And, and I'll spend a few minutes sort of talking about the UK experience and, and also give you some, some data um, and also cover the response we've had from some of the investor groups. So sort of starting from this, the, the value of audit, um, we survey on a two-yearly cycle um, UK stakeholders, um, a product we do called Confidence in Audit, to see what stakeholders actually think of audit. And in a sense, it's, it's really quite a challenging thing to do because audit is only <coughs> as good as its last failure. Um, and it's one of those that has a disproportionate effect. So when we were looking at, at what the priorities might be, um, and I say that from a perspective of, and, and here's a whole other discussion that you can have. Actually, the failure rate in terms of audit in the UK is very low indeed. Um, I have a personal problem with, uh, with this idea that you have to design a product that can never fail. To about three years ago, I went to Rolls-Royce in the UK, who make aero engines, um, and they did a presentation for me, and they talked about the fact that here's one of our engines, and we design it to fail once every 4.4 billion kilometres. Why do we do that? Because if we designed it to never fail, it would never get off the ground. So if you try to say you can design something that never fails, you'll have something that never works. But anyway, two of the challenges that I'll cover here are, are firstly, one, a lack of transparency about audit. A huge amount of work, a huge amount of insight and effort goes into audit. But if, it, if, if all that people see of it is, is, is a report at the end of it that's quite short, that's quite summarised, where is the value of that? And there's also an ongoing challenge in the, the surveying that we do, and that is that the audited entity appoints and pays the auditor, so therefore how do we deal with the, the, the confidence issue there? 
So as I said, corporate governance report in 2012, we coordinated a series of changing, changes to auditing reporting standards in the UK and also to our corporate governance code. And, and the main changes that come through that are relevant for, for, for this discussion are the fact that it, it gave an enhanced role to directors and audit committees in terms of financial reporting. It required the audit committee of an entity to produce an annual report that sits in the annual report and accounts of, of the entity, saying what the work of the committee's been in, in the last year, how they've delivered their mandate and what they've done. Um, and it set the new form of auditor's report um, and audit committee reporting. So we have, we have sort of two new products. In the UK, um, originally, the extended auditor report was targeted at premium UK listed companies. So effectively, those entities that um, adopted the UK corporate governance code, either because they had to or because they chose to. Um, you may be aware that in, in the EU last year, we implemented the new audit directive and regulation. Um, we used that as a way of rolling out extended auditor reporting to all listed entities in the UK for periods beginning on or after the 6th, 17th of June 2016. One thing I can never understand about EU law is why it chooses such bizarre dates as implementation points, but anyway. Um, so, so this is a really interesting time for extended auditor reporting. We've got, uh, on, on one hand a stable population who are looking at year four and year five of implementation. And on the other hand, we've got a whole new group of entities that are seeing extended auditor reporting for the first time. Really important to be able to understand what, what, what comes out of that. So what I'm going to cover, um, we, we've published two reports that are all available on our, our, all our reports are available on our website freely. So we've published two reports on new auditor reporting in the UK. And then there is also a series of additional research that comes out in, in some of the other products that we, um, that we issue um, that, that, that set out what the experience has been. We've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort in engaging with, with investors, with audit firms and others about how they're finding the new report, what they're getting from it, where they want to go next, and indeed um, what some of the problems have been. Um, and, and, and one of the problems, um, and, and, uh, and, and I'll sort of <coughs> perhaps refer to this in, in, in a little more detail, is, is that um, when extended reporting came in, one audit firm um, reported the findings of its audits um, where the audit committee chose to do so. And that was really well received by investors. Um, and and you, you may have um, seen there was, there was a lot of coverage about uh, the, the sort of the poster child was, was Rolls-Royce. Um, and in that auditor's report, the auditor set out not only the work that they'd done, but also their findings from the audit. So it was all out there as a matter of public record. That firm then offered all of its clients in that sector the opportunity to have a similar audit report. However, some audit committees chose not to take that up. So this has built in some, some quite creative tension between, um, au between um, audit committees and investors about what level of information should be available to report on, um, on, on what's happened in an audit. So we've seen significant innovation, um, more and better information, and I say quite an enthusiastic response from investors. You have to be careful, though, because investors will always say that they want more, um, whilst at the same time they'll tell you they want the auditor's report to be shorter. So um, if you were looking at writing a paper about what is the solution here, the solution is seven pages. Um, and I say that because one of, one of, one of our board members, um, who is an audit committee chair, um, told me that he wasn't going to read anything that was any longer than that. Um, <laughs> One of the great changes that we've seen is language that's moving away from quite a generic, guarded language into something that's much more specific, something that's much more open and accessible to, to what um, the user actually wants and to give them um, more understanding. And what we're seeing is that this is, um, in, in turn, providing greater demand for more information. This is particularly in the area of management estimates, so more granularity over reporting, not only the fact that you were able to sign off on this set of financial statements, 
but why did you believe that point in that range was the right point to sign off on? So our requirements um, at a high level um, require the auditor to describe the greatest risk of material misstatement, to describe the greatest effect on the audit strategy and allocation of resources, and also ensure that there's appropriate linkage between the significant issues that are reported to the audit committee and those that are reported publicly in the external auditor's report. So, so that's all we set out. Everything else has been built through innovation on the part of the profession and on um, a, a sort of coalition between audit committees, investors and others. So what have we seen? Well, some of the issues that come up most frequently, and I've got um, some, some graphs to show this in a moment, um, impairments, looking at goodwill in particular, revenue recognition, provisions, acquisitions and disposals, and increasingly pensions in the UK context. A lot of um, entities have significant pension liabilities which will, in years to come, impact on potentially on their ability to be able to pay dividends. In the second and third years um, of reporting, we're seeing a move away from generic statements um, where, for instance, there was um, references in the auditor report to risks of material misstatement through management override or fraud in revenue recognition. So where there's nothing to say, don't say it. Um, what this gives you, and, and I hope that the slides will be available for people to, that, um, because I don't expect you to see this um, in, in, in any detail, but what this actually shows is over three years, um, the, sort of compara the, the, the sort of areas that have come up as key audit matters, and you'll just see that there are some trends in there um, that show how reporting has developed and, and, and possibly how the market has, has responded, and that particularly relates to things like valuations becoming increasingly relevant. So what are we seeing? Um, I talked about language needing to be less generic. So investors are saying they want greater precision. What they don't like is for an auditor to say um, <coughs> mildly cautious, for instance, in describing an estimate. They want to know why an estimate is the right estimate, why it's the right place. So, so uh, the challenge is for an auditor to be able to put that in a form um, that, that is going to be accessible to, to, to investors. Um, I talked about the reporting of, um, of, of, of findings. In the first year, and this is based on um, FTSE 350 companies, only 2% included them. Um, in, in year two, it got up to 20%. I think now we're looking at about 40% in, in year four. So it is growing. Um, and, and, and interestingly, investor groups in the, um, investor groups in the UK actually run an award ceremony now for the best auditors' reports. So there is actually significant recognition and incentive for, um, for auditors to continue to develop. Great demand for explanations now on changes year on year. So why have things changed? Is it because there's new information? Is it because assumptions have changed? Is it because something was wrong last year? Um, this is also particularly important in, in the UK and EU context where we have mandatory rotation and tendering. So when a new auditor comes in, if something changes, they want to know why. If, 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 an, in, if an incoming auditor decided materiality should be higher or lower, why is that the case? On materiality, our standard goes beyond the requirements of the IAASB and the PCAOB proposals that are currently with the SEC. So we require the auditor to explain how they've applied the concept of materiality in planning and performing the audit, and we require them to disclose the materiality threshold for the audit of the financial statements as a whole. One firm in the UK has also consistently um, referred to performance materiality in its auditor's report. Um, performance materiality is incredibly valuable to investors, because effectively it's the auditor's assessment of how good they think the internal control environment in the entity is, how well it's run. What investors have told us is they'd like more explanation about the reasons for the benchmark that's been chosen. So what we've actually seen is, is some concentration of what materiality levels have been set. So if, for instance, you were setting something on the basis of 5% of profit before tax, Previously, you'd have had quite a curve, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've seen a coalescing 
because investors are increasingly asking questions where someone's out of line. And that's my comment there um, about being sceptical about a methodology that always ends up at 5% of, of, of profit. Just to show you briefly, and again, you won't be able to see in, in any detail here, but what I wanted to, to show is on the far left, you've got over four years the use of profit before tax, and in the second set of four columns, you've got adjusted profit. So what we've seen is a real transfer in years three and four of extended auditor reporting away from adjusted profit measures to set materiality to just setting it on the basis of profit before tax. Investors do not like adjusted figures because they feel there's too much wriggle room in there um, for management and, and, and for the auditor to get away with what they might report and, and, and what might be seen as appropriate to cover. And, and again, this shows the same information just split between what we saw in year one, which is the orange line, and what we saw in year four, which is the blue bars. So effectively now, for our FTSE 350 audits, about 50% of them set materiality on the basis of profit before tax. We're also seeing a much greater focus on, on assets in, in business as, as, as well. Um, and again, this shows the tailing off here of, of, prof, of, of using adjusted profit materiality <coughs> benchmarks as, as, as a way of um, setting materiality. So quite an interesting and quite a dramatic shift in the market um, as, as, as investors have been more sort of um, <coughs> willing to specify what they want. In terms of the scope of the audit, we wanted um, auditors to ensure that they described how the audit covered measures such as profit, total assets and revenue, so understand what's actually being covered, how the significant issues and risks have impacted on the work that's actually been done by the auditor, and the relationship between scope and risk and materiality. So really trying to, to set out clearly how the assurance has been gained um, within, within the audit. Investors have responded to that by saying you could do still more. So more information on the difference between um, what's covered in a full scope audit procedure and what's covered through other procedures. And also a push to say much more about quality control arrangements in group audits, particularly international group audits. And we're seeing some of the things come through where audit firms are trying to give much more insight. I was fascinated the first year I saw um, the um, auditor's report for the HSBC group, where, which had a new auditor in 2015. And, and w what was really good is it started off and it said, first, this is why we think we're independent to undertake the audit. And then it said, this is how we have quality controlled our team of 3,000 people in 27 jurisdictions to be able to gather the evidence we need to give an auditor's report. So that's, that's, that's really sort of coming out with, with insight and greater value. So just a final few points. Lessons learned. Auditors' reports are becoming more interesting to read, more insightful, sharing more about what the auditor knows. Um, at the same time, there's the challenge of them becoming longer. They're increasingly well-structured, user-friendly and more fluent. And, and we did some analysis actually looking at um, the number of words on average that audit firms use to describe a key risk. And in the UK, it went from about 700 words um, at the low end, and this is looking at big four audits, to 1,500 words at the high end. So we're actually seeing um, some, some sort of um, attempt to become more fluent and more focused. No evidence that the reporting timetable has been disrupted, and in the UK context, no evidence of increased audit fees. So what would I say? Prescription alone will not deliver innovation. The market responds to an opportunity for innovation. And in the UK context, the audit market has responded incredibly vigorously and in um, a better way than perhaps we could ever have anticipated. And this is really positive. Audit reports do stimulate better engagement between investors and, um, and um, audited entities and also audit firms. Greater transparency over what happens in an audit can drive up audit quality and confidence in the quality of audit. Um, but the, the, the caveat that I'll end on is that that confidence can easily be lost if the quality of the work doesn't reflect the quality of the audit report. And my warning 
is that what we found in year one, when we looked at extended reports, is that sometimes the auditor had written about the audit they wanted to do rather than the one they did. <laughs> and, and so, and so um, where an audit approach had changed because there were problems, because there were other issues, um, you need to make sure that that's actually reflected. So this is, it is intended to be a, a, a quick canter through the UK experience because I realise we've got a lot to cover, but obviously very happy to take any questions later on or discuss um, later on during the day. Thank you.